It's Wednesday, the 2nd of October. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel and tragic news out of Bradley Field, Windsor Locks, Connecticut, with the total loss of the Collings Foundation B-17G known as 909. Here's what we know so far. The Collings Foundation B-17G was conducting flights under the Wings of Freedom tour this morning, local scenic flights in the area, when the crew reported to air traffic control shortly after departure that they were having a problem with the number four engine. Remember on four engine aircraft the engines are numbered from left to right, one through four. After listening to the audio tape myself there was some confusion between the crew and air traffic control as to the nature of their problem. I did not hear the crew declare an emergency with air traffic control and so the controller was wondering if they needed an immediate return back to Bradley Field or would he, the controller, have enough time to sequence in some more jet traffic. Remember Bradley is Connecticut's busiest commercial airport. So the crew of the B-17G was cleared for a left downwind arrival to runway 06. Apparently, according to initial reports, the aircraft did touch down on runway 06, but somehow ended up crashing well off to the right side of the runway into the de-icing facility and burning. There were 13 souls on board the aircraft that includes three crew members and 10 passengers. One person on the ground was injured near the de-icing facility. The three crew members include an aircraft commander in the left seat, a co-pilot in the right seat, and a flight engineer slash crew chief in the jump seat between the two pilots. According to my sources, all three of these crew members were very experienced in the B-17. The weather at the time of the accident was reported as good. It looks like light winds out of the southwest, about four knots, a high ceiling up at 14,000 feet, no factor for today's flight. The casualties were transported to three local area hospitals. The NTSB and the FAA are on the scene at this time. This is a very high visibility aviation accident. The number of fatalities will not be confirmed until victims are identified and next of kin is properly notified. Here's the METAR data for Bradley Field showing good weather for the flight and light winds. Here's the flight aware data showing the flight returning to a left downwind, left base entry, runway 06. And here's the airport layout, runway 06, lower left corner. Here's the location of the de-icing facility off to the right of the approach end of runway 06. where the aircraft ended up hitting some tanks and equipment. So I listened to the live update in the media and the press briefing and press questions, and I want to answer a lot of those questions in this briefing by going through a couple of things. We'll go over the Collins Foundation, what it is, who they are. We'll go a bit over the history of this particular airframe, 909, the B-17G, and then I want to go over the FAA regulations that this type of flying operates under. Many of us have a deep appreciation for aviation history and nonprofit programs like what the Collings Foundation is doing and other nonprofits all throughout the United States allows us to take these flying World War II warbirds and bring them out into the public and expose them to the public and allow everybody to witness this flying aviation history. First, let's review the history of this particular B-17. B-17, uh, civil registration 93012, bureau number 44-83575. 44 means it must be a 1944 year model Boeing B-17. This B-17 did not see action in World War II. It was produced too late. It was used in atomic tests in Yucca Flats, Nevada in 1952. It was abandoned at the test site from 1952 to 1965. By the way, all this information is on the warbirdregistry.org. 
Valley Scrap Metal of Phoenix, Arizona picked it up in 1965, but then Abe Sellards of Aircraft Specialties picked it up at that time, saving it from the boneyard, saving it from the scrapper, stored it in Mesa and stripped for spares. At this point, it's being stripped for spares for the air tanker industry, using to fight forest fires. It was later converted into a flying air tanker in 1977, Mesa, Arizona, as tanker 99, Lady of Yucca. And it flew for, for Globe Air Inc. out of Mesa, Arizona from 1981 to 1985 as tanker 99. It was picked up by the Collings Foundation in October of 1985 and they've owned it ever since. The Collings Foundation delivered it to Kissimmee, Florida in 1987 for a complete restoration back to its original military configuration. It did suffer a crash landing or a crash while landing in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, January 28, 1987. There's two cases of previous crash history on this airframe, according to this report. After that incident, it was repaired and delivered to Kissimmee, Florida for a full restoration in 1991. And in 1995 in Sioux City, Iowa had a undercarriage collapse. So two bits of accident history on this airframe, which is very common on these older type aircraft. It's also common to restore these historic aircraft back to full airworthiness condition, even after major damage events have occurred. By the way, these sort of aircraft do not have data recorders on them. However, there's frequently GoPro cameras mounted all over the aircraft. I'm sure at some point there'll be some video data that shows us what happened in this accident. Now a little bit about the Collings Foundation. The Collings Foundation, this is according to Wikipedia, is a private nonprofit educational foundation located in Stowe, Massachusetts, founded in 1979 by Robert and Caroline Collings, with the mission dedicated to the preservation and public display of transportation-related history, namely automobiles and aviation or aircraft. If you look at their uh, Collings Foundation, they've got nearly 30 flyable aircraft. These kind of Nonprofit organizations are an important part of the preservation of our aviation heritage. And by operating and giving rides in these aircraft, they are able to offset the extensive costs of restoring these aircraft back to operational condition. This is an important part of our aviation legacy and needs to remain intact. Now let's talk about a little bit about the FAA regulations that allows all this to happen. There are three different FAA regulations that govern the flight of aircraft. Part 91 is what I operate under the Mighty Luscombe. That's private flying, not for hire. Part 135 flying is for charter flying. That's unscheduled flight for hire operations. Then there's part FAR part 121 operations, which governs airline type flying. For each FAR part that you operate under, each individual aircraft has an individual category that it is built and designed to. Historic Warbird aircraft were built during wartime. They were not built to transportation category standards of the time. So in order to give rides in a Warbird aircraft and charge for those rides and collect money for them, the FAA, along with these Warbird collectors, had to create another category of regulations. They initially started with a Part 91 exemption, which allowed them to operate under Part 91 for hire, basically donations, with aircraft other than standard or normal category aircraft. Soon, this FAR Part 91 exemption morphed into the Living History Flight Experience Regulation. The FAA worked together with the Warbird operators to create a regulation that would bring these Warbird operators up to nearly a Part 135 standard for flying safety. That means that these operators had to come up with a mountain of paperwork and documentation and systems and oversights that basically emulated the same regulations that a Part 135 operator would have to go through. They had to create an operations manual, a maintenance manual, a pilot training manual, and a maintenance and line support manual. That subjects these operators to check rides, 
to surprise check rides just like anybody else in the Part 135 op world to bring everybody up to the same level of safety standard. I'll post a link to this FAA document which defines the LHFE regulation which allows these nonprofit organizations to operate these historic aircraft in a very narrow window of regulation. For example, you can get a flight in the B-17 for $450. These flights operate out of a fixed base operation. They do not go through the TSA. And you receive an extensive safety briefing from a qualified crew member before boarding the aircraft. So what does this mean for the remaining 17 B-17s that are left flying in the world today? Well, we're not sure, but before legislators start posturing on this, we hope that everybody gets a solid and fundamental understanding of what federal aviation regulations these flights are allowed to operate under. We're going to learn a lot more about this accident very soon. We'll keep you posted. See you here.